One of the most practical means of assessing your relationship to Christ Jesus and of developing confidence in God is to properly assess your personal baptism. The time when you were baptized into Christ and obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. We are trying to teach you to reason about your baptism into Christ and to arrive at some sound conclusions, conclusions that have been revealed by the God of heaven. You'll recall in our last lesson we discussed how baptism has been identified with washing, with your personal purification, cleansing you from sin, involving you in the things of God. You have been separated from the past, from the sordid and sinful past that plagued you. Your baptism is the line of demarcation which separates you from your sin. You have been able to draw near to God enabled by His grace, because you're washed, to draw near to Him. You have been made a king and a priest unto God and have been sanctified, set apart for His use, so that God can express Himself through you if you capitalize upon this confidence that is surely yours in Christ Jesus. Beware of a defiled conscience, a conscience that condemns you, a conscience that is not aware of the forgiveness of the living God. The Word of God tells us in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, in verse 14, that the blood of Jesus Christ purges our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The reason that perhaps that you have not served God as you can is that your conscience has been defiled. You have felt condemned before God, felt that you have been wrong, that your sins have dominated you. But the message of the gospel is that the blood of Jesus Christ can purify that conscience. It can take the guilt away, convince you that you're accepted before God and that you're capable of being used by God. All of heaven recognizes you as a son of God if you're baptized into Christ Jesus. Now let's go on in this association of baptism with the great truths of Scripture by identifying it with the actual act of forgiveness, divine forgiveness. Our text today is taken from the book of Colossians, again, the second chapter, verses 12 and 13, where our baptism is under consideration. Buried with him in baptism, wherein, that is, in your baptism, also ye are risen with him through faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. In a nutshell, this verse is teaching us that when we were baptized into Christ, we believed that God was going to accomplish a great work, the operation of God, as it is called in Colossians 2.12. And our faith in that, in that operation or work of God, that divine accomplishment, our faith in it eventuated in the release of us from our sins. He forgave us all trespasses. Now as we develop this concept of being forgiven by God, it's very important that you do not look upon this as just a mere tradition or a theological thought. This is a reality that has taken place in heaven. Your sins have been forgiven by God. As we think about God and forgiveness, it's important that we have a proper concept of Him, a sound idea about the living God. Now, friend, God is a forgiving God. By that I mean it's God's nature to forgive. He wants to forgive. It's His desire to forgive. He has revealed this consistently in Scripture. One of the great hallmark revelations was given to Moses in Exodus, the 34th chapter. Here, Moses had requested that God show him his glory. That is, that God reveal to Moses his real person, what he was like. God hid Moses in the cleft of a rock and passed by before him and proclaimed his name. He announced his character. He told him what he was like. And incorporated in that revelation are the words found in Exodus 34, verse 7. God is a God that keeps mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. God wants to be known as a forgiving God. 
The way God reveals himself is the way God wants to be known and appropriated by faith. Think of that text in Psalms 86 and verse 5. It says, God is a God that's ready to forgive. If you've not been forgiven of your sins, it's not because God doesn't want to forgive you. God has no hesitancy at all to forgive. He is ready to forgive. And again, the psalmist proclaimed in Psalm 130 and verse 4, There is forgiveness with the Lord that he may be feared. So you must perceive God as a God willing and desirous to forgive. It's his nature to forgive. He doesn't do so because he has to. He's never forced into forgiveness. This is the display of his heart. He's ready to forgive, a God that forgives iniquity. Now, there have been holy men in the past that have seen this and have capitalized upon it. At one time, the entire nation of Israel was spared because Moses, perceiving this truth that God is a forgiving God, pled for Israel with God on the basis of his character and nature and willingness to forgive. The account is found in the book of Numbers, the 14th chapter. And I think reviewing this will teach us that we should capitalize upon God's nature to forgive. Numbers 14, verse 17 and 18. Now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiven iniquity and transgression. The 19th verse, Moses made a plea upon the basis of that revelation, pardon I beseech thee the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of thy mercy. You see, Moses knew that God wanted to forgive. And here in this text, when God had threatened to obliterate the nation of Israel because of their transgression, Moses stepped into the gap and reminded God of what he, had, he himself had said that he was a God that forgave iniquity and sin, that was his nature, that was his tendency, that was his desire. And Moses said, now do it, Lord, do it. Work your character, forgive these people. Solomon, a wise man at the dedication of the temple, also referred to the forgiving nature of God. In the book of 1 Kings, the 8th chapter in verse 30, again the occasion is the dedication of the temple. Solomon pled with God and appealed to his nature. Hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people Israel, when they shall pray toward this place, and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and when thou hearest, forgive. Solomon knew God was a forgiving God. The question is, do you? Our text tells us that when you were baptized into Christ, he forgave you all trespasses. Not because he had to, because he wanted to, because he desired to. Our Lord Jesus himself taught us to appeal to God's nature to forgive. In that great prayer of instruction in Matthew, the sixth chapter in verse 12, Jesus taught us to say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us, Lord. That's your nature to forgive. Jesus did not ask us to do anything that was not right. It is right for you to ask God to forgive you. And you asked him eloquently when you were baptized into Christ. However, there's a point of technicality here that we should mention. God will not simply clear the guilty. He will not just wink at sin, sweep it under the rug, and passively forget it. There must be a basis, a sound reason for forgiveness before God will pass it on to you. In Exodus, the 34th chapter and verse 7, God revealed to Moses that he would by no means clear or acquit the guilty. Amos in his book also referred to this truth, that he will by no means acquit or clear the guilty. There must be a sound basis, a sound reason for God to forgive man. In Romans, the third chapter, in verse 26, the apostle describes one aspect of our salvation that is often overlooked. There he announces that God is both the just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. God not only justifies, he is just and right in doing so. 
So for God to forgive sin, he must not only forgive it because he wants to do it, which he does want to, but he must do it because it's right to do it, correct and proper to do it. Now we are preaching a gospel to you that says in Christ Jesus it is right for God to forgive you. That when you embrace the gospel of Christ and are baptized into Christ, obeying from the heart the form of doctrine delivered unto you, it is right for God to separate you from your sins. It is right for him to do for you what he did for no other generation prior to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here in your baptism you experience the actual fulfillment of the new covenant promise as found in Hebrews the 8th chapter and verse 12. I will be merciful to their unrighteousnesses and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. That's forgiveness. In forgiveness, sin is separated from the sinner. Transgression is separated from the transgressor. And guilt is separated from the guilty. And never shall they meet again as they walk by faith. <clears throat> now remission of sins has been preached and can be experienced. Before our Lord Jesus ascended up into heaven, he met with his disciples. And he told them in Luke the 24th chapter and verse 47 that repentance and remission of sins was to be preached. Remission of sins preached, proclaimed. That's what you have in Christ Jesus is the forgiveness, the remission of sins. It is so real that it's preached through Christ Jesus. We are proclaiming to you that are baptized into Christ what you have. Not what you can have, what is, what has actually occurred. Now notice our text. What a glorious thing is revealed here. Colossians 2 and verse 13 says, Associate in it with your baptism that he has forgiven you all trespasses. All of them. Not just the worst, not just the least. All trespasses have been forgiven you. We have this forgiveness. It's a possession that we have. There in Ephesians, the first chapter and verse 7, and again in Colossians, the first chapter and verse 14, this same truth is proclaimed, that we have this remission of sins, in whom we have redemption through his blood, and notice this, even the forgiveness of sins. Possessing redemption being redeemed, having your debt paid by Christ, having God no longer considering you a debtor for your sin, is having the forgiveness of sins. It's not something you can have, believer. It's something you do have. The gospel to baptize believers is this. We have, we possess redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins. You have it, and you have it now. The Word of God proclaims that this is a just thing. God is both just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Romans 3.26 Think of your salvation as a just and equitous salvation. You have no doubt said this. I have said it in the past. I regret that I have, it was my own ignorance that stated it, that we receive mercy and not justice in Christ Jesus. This is not so. We receive both mercy and justice in Christ Jesus. The mercy was based upon the desire of God, and the justice was based upon the work of Christ. Our forgiveness is for Jesus' sake. Ephesians, the fourth chapter and verse 32 says that God has forgiven us for Christ's sake. Now let's translate that into a more meaningful statement. If God had retained in his memory your sin after you were baptized into Christ's death, it would have been unrighteous. It would have been unlike God not to forgive sin in those that obeyed the gospel and were baptized into Christ Jesus. He was just in doing it which means, can you receive it? He would have been unjust in not doing it. For God not to forgive you would be unjust if you have received his son and obeyed him. 
Sin, you see, has actually been put away by Christ Jesus. He appeared, Hebrews 9, 26 says, once in the end of the world to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He literally put it away from the face of God. And when you are brought into Christ Jesus, your sin is gone. It is forgiven. It is remitted. And it's unrighteous for God to view it any other way. It all happened when you were baptized. Now let's go back and review this text again. Colossians, the second chapter, verses 12 and 13. Your forgiveness occurred when you were baptized. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened or made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. It happened when you were baptized. Well, you may say, I do not uh, feel as though it happened when I was baptized. What evidence do I have that it actually happened? You have as much evidence that it actually happened as that God is in heaven and that Christ intercedes at his right hand. God has said that it happened. God has proclaimed it happened. And it's only unbelief that doubts it. Do not be afraid to associate your baptism with the remission of sins. The Holy Spirit of God moved men to say it and men to write it. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. While some men unfortunately repudiate the association of baptism with remission, let it not be you. You must make that association. God has made it. You become aware of salvation through the remission of sin. In Luke, the first chapter, in verse 77, the prophet said that he would bring the knowledge of salvation through the remission of sin. Now, salvation is a great transaction. It's something that God planned for ages, that he fulfilled in Christ Jesus, saving people from their sins. Jesus says, I came not to destroy men's lives, but to save them. But that salvation is, is so great that to know it, you've got to have your sins remitted. Let's state it another way. Unless in your heart you are persuaded that God has taken your sins away, that he's purged you of him, that he's washed you of your sin, that he's forgiven you all trespasses, salvation, you are not confident of salvation. But when you know you're forgiven, when you know that what God promised has come to pass when you were washed, that he has forgiven you all trespasses, the knowledge of salvation becomes yours. You know you're God's and you know God is yours. You know you have an inheritance in heaven and you know that Christ Jesus is abiding with you. The knowledge of salvation is confidence, assurance, it began when you were baptized. Now think back when you were baptized into Christ Jesus. If you did it sincerely and out of a pure heart, there's no question in my mind, but that when you came up out of those waters, you knew you did what was right. You felt clean. You felt pure. You knew you were accepted by God at that moment. That was the beginning of your confidence. In Hebrews, the third chapter in verse 14, it refers to the beginning of our confidence and to hold it. Don't lose that. If you've just newly been baptized into Christ, maintain that confidence. Think back frequently upon what occurred when you were baptized into Christ Jesus. And then receive these words of Hebrews 10, 35. Cast not away thy confidence. Baptism, of course, is not the only source of confidence. There are other sources. 
I think of one mentioned in 1 John 5, 14. And it might be well to mention it here because this actually does tie in with your baptism. And this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. Now with that scripture in mind, let's go back to your baptism. Now the scripture tells us that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. We're confident of this. You don't question that, do you, believer? Now associating that with your baptism, our text in Acts 22, 16 says, Arise and be baptized, washing away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. In your baptism, you actually were calling upon God's name. You were asking God to do what he'd committed himself to do. He'd commissioned his son to tell men, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. As you believed and were baptized, you were calling upon his name, making an appeal to that promise, saying, Lord, let this happen to me. Now, according to 1 John 5, 14, if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. And we know when you called upon him in your baptism, you were in the center of God's will. There may be a lot of things, believer, that you have not done properly. A lot of things that you wish you could have done better. But you were never more perfect. You were never more 100% right than when you were baptized into Christ Jesus. Let that be a ground for your confidence. The full assurance of faith, another term for confidence, another term for being bold in God's presence, has been associated with you having your body washed with pure water, with you being purified in God's eyes when you were baptized into Christ Jesus. Bodies washed with pure water. You must go on from there. Your body was not washed with pure water just to bring an end to the old life. It was to induct you into the new life. The objective in you being baptized was not merely to be forgiven. It was to be forgiven so that you could become involved in the good work of God. Become a part, if you please, of his enterprise. Now, don't doubt God's integrity. God has promised in Acts 2, verse 21, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, you called upon him when you were baptized. God has integrity, perfect integrity. Don't you doubt it. Don't doubt that he received you. You called upon him. You were saved. Or to put it in the words of our theme today, you were forgiven all trespasses. Now you can resist the devil with all confidence. And may I say this, that if you do not have confidence, you will not be able to successfully resist the devil. The old serpent capitalizes upon a guilty conscience. If your heart condemns you, and you feel as though you're wrong, and guilt has plagued your soul, Satan will inevitably capitalize upon it and drive you away from God. You must in your heart receive this truth that you've been forgiven all trespasses. You must receive it. And when you do, according to James, the fourth chapter and verse seven, if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. You see, Satan is as much offended by the truth as God is offended by the lie. Now, the truth is you've been forgiven all trespasses. In the confidence of that, resist Satan's attempts to make inroads into your life. Now remember this good news that Satan has been cast down. In Revelation, the 12th chapter in verse 10, the scriptures apprise us of this. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser, of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now here the truth is stated that Satan has been toppled from a lofty position. He was toppled when salvation came and when the kingdom of Christ came. 
Previous verses in this text of Revelation 12 tells us that there was a war in heaven, that Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, Satan and his angels, and that the holy angels prevailed, and Satan and his angels were cast out of heaven. Now this is apocalyptic language to describe to us the impact of Christ entering into heaven having accomplished redemption. When Jesus entered into heaven with his own blood, as the scriptures tell us, having obtained eternal redemption for us, an intercessor was placed in heaven for us. Jesus Christ was set down at the right hand of God to make intercession for us according to the will of God. And when that intercessor sat down, the accuser was cast out. So to put it another way, in heaven you have someone speaking for you, not against you. You have been elevated to a higher position than Job. In Job's day, the devil spoke against him in heaven, according to Job chapters 1 and 2. But Satan has been cast down. And now instead of having someone remind God of your sin or accusing you, saying you have certain liabilities to sin in your life, you have an intercessor before God. Why? Because sins have really been forgiven. God now prefers to listen to an intercessor plead for you because your sins have been removed from him. Now let's review briefly what we have seen. We have seen that remission of sins is preached and that it's preached because God is a forgiving God. He wants to forgive. He delights to forgive. And he confirms that you have been forgiven when you were baptized into Christ Jesus. All of heaven recognizes that this has been done. Jesus intercedes because this has been done. The Holy Spirit's been sent by God because this has been done. And the gospel of the good salvation of God is preached because this has been done. Now, properly viewed, your baptism is part of your arsenal. You can overcome the devil with it. You can overcome your own sinful inclinations with it. All trespasses have been forgiven. It happened when you were baptized. Now, capitalize upon it by remembering it, believing it, and going on to perfection.